there's a part of the child in all of us. What do babies need to thrive? A stark study was made about this in Austria in the 1940s. Two sets of babies were tracked, who both had identical and excellent material care. But one set of babies was looked after by loving, smiling mothers, the other by faceless nurses in a huge state-of-the-art orphanage. It was found that those who were looked after anonymously had severe development problems. The death of some orphans was even ascribed by doctors to nothing less than a lack of sustained attention. We look for rewards in terms of promotion, in terms of money, in terms of buying a nicer house. For most of us, the reward you really want is attention from whoever it is you're working for. And if you ask yourself, who am I working for? Who do I want to notice how well I'm doing? Is it my partner? Am I still trying to please my own father? Is it my mother? Is it the children whom I want still to see me as, you know? Um, it, it's sometimes quite interesting to work out for yourself because you will find, I think, everybody will always find that they are actually looking for somebody's attention and approval. I think we want to feel secure about the people we love and who love us more than we want anything else in the world, including to win a million on who wants to be a millionaire. If you said to somebody who wants to win a million or who wants to be entirely secure in their love relationships, sexual and non-sexual, I think I know what the answer would be. So that's what we're looking for, security, a feeling of being safely loved and it not being risky. Just like babies, we need those small signs of care and attention that we capture with the word love. Without this love, we may not die, but we will end up anxious and sad. You could say that there are two kinds of love that we search for throughout our lives, romantic love and love from the world. Romantic love is familiar enough. It's the stuff of every novel, love song, and magazine article. But our search for love from the world is no less intense. But it tends to be spoken of in rather shameful, caustic terms, as though this was something that only a deficient or an envious soul would be interested in. But far from it, our search for status is linked to something that is as essential to us as light, heat, food, and water. Once we work out how central the need for love is, a lot of things become clearer. From why we go shopping to why we sometimes kill one another. Much of the reason why we go shopping is unconnected to any urgent material need. We often shop in order to persuade the world that we are worthwhile, interesting people. We often shop for emotional rather than practical reasons. A lot of consumption is about acquiring status symbols, material objects whose primary use is psychological. They are objects that signal to the world that we are worthy of dignity and respect. This is the home of Stephen Bailey, a style consultant who worked for many years with Terence Conran, and an expert on why we buy designer goods. I'm not certain objects make us more lovable, but they certainly make us more interesting. I mean, knowing I was going to be talking to you today, I made a very conscious decision about which of five wristwatches I should wear, and I was very you know, perhaps some would say anxious about what your expectations might be, because I thought you'd be thinking I'd put a Rolex on. And instead, I've chosen a particularly obscure form of antique watch with a brown ostrich strap. Um, now, I'm not, uh, I suppose to some people this is the most monstrous form of affectation, and it, they're probably right. But I, I find it absolutely fascinating that the mere application of a, you know, of, a, of a device to one's wrist can entirely change you know, one's style and the way in which other people interpret me.
I'm acutely aware of the, the status messages which objects convey, and I remember some years ago going through a particularly sort of philosophically trying ordeal with a fountain pen. And you know, because of the way I see the world, I've always been anxious just to acquire, you know, the simplest and best table, you know, the simplest and best whatever, chair, watch, whatever. I had identified a particular brand of fountain pen as, and I write a lot, so I, pens are quite important to me personally, I had identified this sort of fountain pen as the ultimate of its kind. So I saved up and I, you know, I bought one and I loved it. And then, to my horror, I found this hitherto exclusive and rare device uh, was becoming more and more popular. And I remember going through this terrible, terrible moment of self-examination, thinking, should I now, now that my revered fountain pen has become popular, should I hide it away and not use it? And ultimately, I decided, no, the best thing to do was actually, actually just bash on, you know, and brave it, because you know, I thought it was, um, I thought it ultimately it was more arch to hide it away. The man responsible for the term status symbols was the American sociologist Thorstein Veblen, who wrote a wonderfully witty, even bitchy book called The Theory of the Leisure Class in 1899. Having observed the rich at leisure near his home in Connecticut, he became fascinated by how people acquire certain luxury goods to symbolize their high status. Many clothes were deliberately designed to show that the people wearing them didn't need to work, indeed couldn't possibly do so in something so impractical. People are often mocked for their interest in luxury goods, luxury cars or clothes, and they're described as being greedy for wanting these things. But I think that's to miss an emotional subtlety of the whole subject. People are attracted to status symbols principally because they want to feel valued. Most modern cars are very efficient in getting you from A to B. So if there's a continuing appetite for so-called luxury cars, the reason typically has little to do with engineering, ABS brakes and satellite communication. It has to do with wanting to be treated nicely. What's special about this car? Well, we're in an environment, it's a very nice place to be. I mean, looking at the, looking at the dash as a whole, uh, you, you've got acres of walnut wood, um, a stitched leather top of dash. We also have a feature in here called active seats, which will massage your uh, posterior for long journeys to make sure you don't get an unbum. iDrive controls the display panel that you look at in the centre. It has uh, the facility to control the navigation system in the vehicle, mm -hmm. so you're able to dial up uh, at your front door, wherever you want to go, by road name and house number to, to that detail, right. uh, and it will take you there. What's the, in the tray below? The tray below is, uh, is your ashtray. Right. Even I have one of those. <laughs> Even you have one of those. Tell me, what will owning a car like this do for you as a person? It would be wrong to sort of compartmentalise owners of cars, um, but certainly this car is going to say a lot about you. Uh, the, the visual appearance of the car uh, is a strong, muscular appearance to the car. It, it has a lot of purpose to it. I think owning a car like this gives you a tremendous amount of confidence. Perhaps it's those who strive hardest to be successful who are most haunted by feelings of failure. Scratch the surface of almost anyone who's made it to the top of their chosen field and you'll find an unusually vicious fear of being a loser. After all, what need would there be to be so impressive if it wasn't for a fear of being the opposite? There's a sad, emotionally deprived side to upmarket car sales. <laughs>